Good afternoon, everyone. I am here with my daily devotions to complete Romans chapter 15 and 16. And this actually finalizes the book. Yay, we're here. And I'm hoping to sum all this up in about half an hour. And um, I have my notes here in big letters in the hope that I don't need to wear my glasses because the reflection is really bad. So you can't, I feel like, you know, kind of, Anyway, so we're going to try our best without it. All right, so we're looking at Romans chapter 15, which is actually quite a long one. I will need them for that. And um, in Romans chapter 16, which is actually quite a short one. So we're just going to start with, um, okay, my theme for Romans chapter 15 is Christ our joy, peace, and hope of glory. All right, and the scriptures that I've used um, to focus through. And may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And also I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience. Remember, we're called to the obedience that comes through faith. And then by word and deed, by power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I think that's, uh, Ill, 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 hang on, Illyricum, Illyricum, there you go, um, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. So Paul is making, some, he's making summations of things that he's done, but he's also um, completing missionary journey, journeys and has... Um, you know, filled the region with the gospel. And so there's not many places locally that haven't already heard the word, whether from him or through others. So, um, but he's proud of his work as we discover later. So basically, I'm just going to read you verses one to seven. All right. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through their encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Now may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, um, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, accept one another as Christ has accepted you for the glory of God. So it's like a brief prayer there at the end of that little section. So chapter 15 is basically a summation of the whole letter, opening with concluding comments on why we should live for the good of our fellow believers. So it's actually finishing off from chapter 14, where he was talking about um, the, the believers whose faith was weak and ate only vegetables, and the believer whose faith was strong and had great freedom in Christ. Um, and so verses 1 to 7 outline, firstly, that we need to do this because that's the example that Christ set for us when he gave himself as a servant for the good of others and also because it will lead to a true form of harmony that will result in a single unified voice that gives glory to God. Now differences of opinion regarding disputable matters as we talked about yesterday don't have to be a breach in unity and where they're not they're a powerful testimony of the word to the world of the word living in us and the love among believers and this affirms the command that Christ gave to us well in John 13 35 when he said, um, love one another by all this, men, by all this, the world will know that you are my disciples. Just let me find it so I can read it to you. As it is written, um, it says, a new commandment I give you that you will love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, I always find that really interesting because I thought, you know, um, if you have love for the people that hate you, if you have willing to show forgiveness for the people that have wronged you, if you are willing to, you know, um, be kind and gracious to those that persecute you and, and are mean to you and all that sort of stuff, I would have thought that would be a testimony and indeed it is. But Jesus himself said that the world would know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. How so? Because everyone that comes into the body of Christ is coming from somewhere different. There's a whole bunch of random people put together in what we call a local church. 
and the unity there that comes to us through the word and the bond of the spirit brings a testimony that is um, amazing about the love of God because we all might come from different cultures, from different ethnicities, from different countries, from different um, walks of life, different professions and different um, lifestyles. And yet in church, we can have a unity around the truth, around Jesus, around the word. And so um, even with all of those kinds of differences, we are able to come together and agree and have harmony around the truth about salvation in Christ and the righteousness that is by faith. And then there are other things, even doctrinally, where we can have differences of opinion about um, what's acceptable to do, what's not to do. The fact that it comes from faith is all that makes it acceptable. If we do something that we're, that violates our conscience, remember, that's the issue. But if we walk and we allow each other to walk in the unity that comes from accepting one another with those differences, then we actually create what Jesus was talking about. And that is the greatest testimony that the world will see by us and know us as his disciples through our love for one another. And then, so Paul says to accept one another in, in church the way that he willingly accepted us into the body for the glory of God. We don't do it just because we're trying to be nice to somebody else, although that's good. We don't do it just because we're living for the good of others, although that's the big motivation because that's what Jesus did. But we do it because it brings glory to God. And conversely, when we don't do it, we rob God of that glory. You know, perhaps we even bring shame to the name because we don't live up to who we should do, you know, how we should live as Christians. So we do it for the glory of God and for him and his witness in the earth so that others will look and go, wow, this God is something else if he can get these people to live together in this way. So Paul, this Paul lead, leads Paul then into an appreciation of Christ as the servant and um, points out that this is a fulfillment of the prophecies within the Old Testament scriptures. So he's touching on once again his um, argument, if you like, for the Jews to understand that this was always the plan of God. All right, so um, it spoke of the glory of God among the Gentiles in these verses. Servanthood is also where he started in Romans 1.1 1, 1, when he speaks of himself. And he's also encouraging us to do likewise. So it runs throughout the whole passage here that we are called to servanthood. In speaking of Jesus as our example, Paul returns to the hope that's held out in the gospel to both the Jew and the Gentile. He rejoices in the glorious good news that's laid out in the Old Testament verses, reiterating them for the Jews so that they can see that this was always God's plan. Now let me read you that section. So it's... um. Verses 8 to 13. Hold on. So, for I, for I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs. Remember, God's promises stand forever. His calling and election are sure. He doesn't ever change his mind or renege on his word. And in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, as it, said, it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come. And even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him that will the Gentiles hope. So that's pretty clear what he's saying there, that God always had it in his plan that the Gentiles would come to salvation through the Jews and Jesus. Amen. And then he says another little prayer. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. So that comes from faith so that the power of the Holy Spirit may abound in hope. All right. So we've got a bit of hope going on there. And the thing about hope is that it comes from the word. Hope is not something that we see or that we glean from what's around us. Okay, it's Bible hope. So he closes that section with that little prayer, that short prayer, meaningful, sub substantial, short prayer. Um, hope and endurance go together. So in the previous one, he's referred to as the God of all, the God of encouragement, the God of, endu the God of endurance and the God of encouragement. All right, and in this one, in this fray, it passage, he's referred to the God of hope. Um, now, hope, endurance, and encouragement all go together. When we have strong hope, we endure joyfully and patiently. 
and are encouraged by what we believe. It keeps us standing. The joy of the Lord is our strength and we rejoice in the hope that we have while we're going through whatever it is that we're going through, needing to endure through. Now this is echoed in Romans 8 verses 23 to 25 and also in Romans 5, 5 verses 1 to 5. Um, and like Abraham in Romans 4, 18, whose hope was contrary to circumstances, we hope in the promise and not in anything that's physical or natural. So we need the Spirit of God and we need faith that, that believes what the Word says, which credits to us as righteousness. We need that kind of stuff happening here to enjoy this hope. So I'm just going to go back and look quickly at these verses. So Romans 8, I shall go to Romans 5 first. All right, so since then we have been justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And through him we've also obtained um, access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has, been, who has been given to us. Amen. So you can see the connection there of what happens with hope and the hope of glory and joy and rejoicing and peace. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then in Romans 8, verses 23 to 25, we've got um, and not only creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly, as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, which is the final part, the final part of our completed salvation. Amen. Um, for in this hope we were saved. Not um, Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it patiently. So in other words, our salvation is completed when this body gets transformed into the new glorified body that we're going to have for eternity. But we hope for that because that's our hope in the resurrection. Because for that new body to come, generally speaking, people die and fall asleep in Jesus. But because we are born again and because we live in the day that Jesus may return, we could be changed in a twinkling of an eye. <coughs> that's something there. Okay, out, out, you frog. All right, where am I? And then Romans chapter 4, if we go back there regarding Abraham, it says... Um, in hope he believed against hope, or Abraham hopes against hope, that he should become the father of many nations. As he has been told, so shall your offspring, offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong. Um, in his faith and he gave glory to God fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised and that is why faith was counted or credited to him as righteousness and it's the same for us if we will believe the promises then um, we will be looking at that promise for our hope not what's around us not for a sign or or um, an indicator or something like that in the flesh through these natural senses but through our spirit man by faith the just shall live by faith and then that's credit to us as righteousness amen hallelujah that's good paul encourages um the romans in their obedience in the faith um and he reiterates the his place as the apostle to the gentiles in admonishing and teaching and reminding them of how they should live and how proud he is for the thorough work that he has completed by the power of and in partnership with the Holy Spirit. So let me just read that section, okay? Um, verses 14 to 21. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you are yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all the knowledge and able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very boldly, by way of a reminder because of the grace of God given me to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles and in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus then I have reason to be proud of my work for God for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, 
Illic, Illic, Ill. <laughs> There's that word again. Illyricum. I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ, and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have been told of him, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. So he's um, like evangelized the whole local region, and what he hasn't covered, someone else has. So it's all, it's kind of completed, and he's going to be heading back and hopes to see them in Rome on his trip back. On, a, on his way to Spain. But first he has to go through um, to Jerusalem and deliver a gift for the believers there, uh, a gift of aid for them. And um, he gets to that in the next section. So um, so that's just a summation of, you know, this is why I've written this letter to you because I am the apostle to the Gentiles. It is my job to make sure that you are fully aware of these things and walking in them, all right, and how to walk in them. Okay, so, um, and then he, uh, then he goes on to talk about his plans. So he concludes chapter 15 with some information about a potential visit, which takes him like five years to get around to. Um, but it would be fun to line this up with the timeline of the trips um, that I've done previously using the book of Acts. So he wrote this when he was in Corinth, um, probably around anywhere from uh, 55 to 58 AD and it, they reckon that he made it to Rome in around 60 AD so you know it's, it's been, it was a few years before he actually got to fulfill his desire to see them and um, he did go through quite a bit before he got there but he got a hero's welcome according to Acts ch- chapter 28 when he did arrive they gave him an emperor's welcome they came out to see him and everybody knew who he was and It was very encouraging for him, so Dr. Luke wrote in Acts 28. Um, Okay, so verse 22, This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you, but now since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, because he's already evangelized everywhere, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain, and to be helped on my journey there by you, once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints, for Macedonia and Archaea have been pleased to make some contributions for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. And he had um, also written letters from there, from their Macedonia and um, Achaia, like the other epistles, some of the other epistles were written from there. Um, for they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings of the Jews, They ought also to be of service in them in material blessings. When, therefore, I have completed this and I have delivered to them what has been collected, I leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. So he's very positive and uplifting toward the Romans. This is a good letter. I appeal to you, brothers, by the Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. And then he makes one more little um, short blessing. May the God of peace be with you all. So um, the the ending there kind of gives a little bit more color and and context to the time and the... um, the season that Paul is in when he writes this book because he still has to go to Jerusalem and and not be you know um, ambushed by them and killed but then he ends up in Roman imprisonment too but that's after he actually gets there so um, now just for my Romans chapter 15 my um, application from it what I take from this reading today or my study of it this time around is um It's all about the hope held out in the gospel, the encouragement and the endurance that I find in the hope of glory. And we've talked about the hope of glory from early on in the book of Romans. And for me, it's not just about the hope of glory in eternity. It's the hope of glory in us. It's Christ in us is the hope of glory. And that's now. Eternal life started the moment that you were born again. Eternal life is knowing the Father, according to John 17, John 17, 3, and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. So eternal life is the knowledge of God and it came the instant you were born again so that hope of glory is Christ in us and we're living in it now 
and we're living in the hope that we will see his likeness come forth in us and then it will extend to the redemption of our bodies with a full body resurrection at the time of his coming. Amen. So um, that's and the coming close of the age that will see us carried away to share eternity with him. In 1 John 3, 8, it says that we purify ourselves with this hope of his appearing. I want to read that to you. Um, because for a long time, no one talked about the coming of the Lord. And it was like it was almost a forgotten thing. And yet it was such a critical part to the believers of, of long ago. And it was supposed to remain so. It was never supposed to become something, you know, like obviously, yes, they, they start thinking, oh, it's been forever, he's not coming, but that's not true. And so there's been a reviving of the knowledge, you know, of the confidence that Jesus is coming soon. And um, I believe it. So where is it? It says, uh, it's John 3, 3, sorry, not 3, 8. And everyone who has this hope, hang on, let me see. I want to read it. Um, Behold, beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we will know that when he appears, for we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself as he is pure. So it's our constant anticipation of his coming that actually keeps us pure as well because we live in a place of readiness and, and um, uh, you know, free conscience, clear consciences and um, open heart toward him. So it's all about, for me, Romans, my oh, this chapter, is about living well and what our God can be in and through us because of this hope of glory. He brings endurance, encouragement, joy, peace, faith, harmony, unity, and ultimately glory to his name as we um, stay in that place of obedience that we're called to. So it causes me to meditate even more on actually seeing Jesus, my Lord, face to face. So if you spend any time thinking about that, it actually will impact um, your day-to-day -day because you will be living in the light of that moment. And you can see that why that, that would purify your, um, your life, your heart, everything. Because if you're living in, uh, in, a, in the glory of his countenance, you want to be um, found clean. <laughs> so you can't do that. You can't stay there. If your heart is condemning you, you don't want to stay there. So you have to live clean before the Lord so that you can enjoy that radiance. So just in closing for chapter 15, um, my prayer is, Heavenly Father, the prospect of being in your holy presence beyond the veil of flesh draws my breath from me even now. May all my hearers and I ever want to live in your presence day and night so that we barely notice the shift in our body's constitutions when the time comes for us to, to go meet you in the air. So familiar at home in you, and in with you, Lord Jesus, so comfortable in um, our place at your feet by Mary, who loved to be there. Lord God, we're just yielding every moment to your supreme direction out of earnest love to please you so that we may not be naked of good works of faith at your coming, but clothed in fine linen of righteous acts and good deeds, just as it is declared so in Revelation 6.19. Help my hearers and I, Lord, by the power of your spirit to keep our hearts and minds set on things above and do everything we can to assist our believers, fellow believers, to do likewise so that we will have lamp, lamps with oil to spare come midnight. Amen. Hallelujah. All right, so just moving quickly on to chapter 16. This is a, a fairly short treatment of this one. Concluding thoughts and personal greetings. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages but has now been disclosed, and through the prophetic writings been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God, be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. That's Romans 26 and 25, uh, 25 to 27. So um, my theme, like I said, is just it's concluding thoughts and personal greetings. All right, so he has a long list of names that I'm not going to read um, because I'm not doing that kind of study with it today. But it would be a great search to go through and um, learn about each one of these people and how they fit into the, the, you know, the, the puzzle that is Paul's life. 
So um, his personal greetings provide added context and backdrop regarding other fellowships and cross-referencing events and visiting ministers, missionary aides and relationships and also reveal the presence of Tertius, who is actually the one scribing the letter as Paul dictates. Now, um, so, hang on, we've got, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Crenshaw, at, at Ken, Kenshray, I can't, <laughs> not sure about that one, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and help her in whatever they may need from you, for she has been a patron of many and myself as well. So I'm not sure if she's actually a visiting, like an itinerant minister. Greet, um, greet. Priscilla and Aquila, Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who wish their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved, oh, too many names here, Epinetus, who was the first convert to Christ in Asia. Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. They are well known to the apostles and they were in Christ before me. Greet and Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord, greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Statius, greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ, greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus, greet my kinsman Herodian, greet those in the Lord who belong in the family of Narcissus, greet those workers in the Lord, Tephana and Tryphosa, I think they're two sisters. Greet the beloved Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Yay, the mamas. Greet um, Asyncritus, <laughs> Phlegon, Hermes, Petrobas, Hermas, and the brothers who are with them. Greet Philologus, Philogus, Philologus, wow. Julia. Nurkus, I should have gone through these names. <laughs> Nurkus and his sister and Olympus and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. So what an honor, like just like my friend Sharon Martin, my kingdom sister said, what an honor to be in a list of names that are actually recorded in this letter by the Apostle Paul. Because these are significant people and they're obviously significant believers in the Lord and true believers in the Lord for them to be on this list. And I think that's one of the most amazing things about that passage. But as far as the individual people, I think that would make a great, more in-depth search to deal with um, regarding chapter 16. And it would put more of the background context into place for understanding the fabric of Paul's life. Um, actually, I think the way that I wrote it was, um, these are all those his heart longs for and whose faith in whose faith he rejoices. Following this, he does give a final warning, warning about divisive and flattering people, but ultimately he also says that the God of Satan will soon, God of peace will soon crush Satan under our feet. Don't you like that? The God of peace will crush something. The God of peace will crush wickedness. It will, the God of peace will crush Satan. And Paul ends where he began with the obedience that comes from faith commenting on their obedience, being known to all and affirming his success in leading them to this path. So, um, where am I? Okay, so he says, I appeal to you brothers to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles. Contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught, avoid them, avoid them, don't entertain them, don't have an argument with them, don't debate with them, don't get caught up in controversies with them, avoid them. He talks about that with Timothy too. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ but their own appetites and by smooth talk and flattery they deceive the hearts of the naive. For your obedience is known to all so that I rejoice over you but I want you to be wise with what is good and innocent as to what is evil. Don't you love that? Shrewd as vipers but innocent as doves, Jesus said. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace, do you like that? It's under your feet, under your feet, because you are the body of Christ. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. So do Lucius and Jason and Sosipata, my kinsman. I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, who is host to me and the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, and our brother Quartus greet you. So he's got another list of names, but from where he is in Corinth that he's sending those messages on. And finally, this is the verse that I started with. Now to him who is able to strengthen you. And this is how I sum up not only this chapter, 
But I really think this is the summation of the whole book of Romans. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of, the, of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed through the prophetic writings and has been made to all, known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God of glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. And so um, that's the end of chapter 16. Now, my application from this chapter, um, on a surface level, it's the warning that I take from the, the epistle and the victory that follows um, through perseverance. So um, like he's got that warning there of not to be um, fooled by those that come into our ranks, but to recognize them for what they are and to avoid them and to make a stand against them. Remain true to the word and to the obedience that comes from faith, not allowing pride or disappointment or slander any place and keeping my own heart free of guile. This is what I take from this chapter. To keep my own heart free of guile is important. And it's especially important when you have different things going on in your world, in relationships, in workplaces, in church, fellowships, in different things. People are people and you're always going to be dealing with different types of challenges as a result. And um, I find even for myself at the moment, and this is not uncommon, <laughs> but you do get different opportunities to um, guard your heart against a bitter root, you know, which is what uh, is spoken of in Hebrews as well. Because if we get if we take offense, if we get disappointed in God, if we get um, angry, if we believe a lie, there are just different things that become doorways that give the devil a stronghold for us, and they will become like bitterness, uh, resentment. They will become a root that gets hard to get out and it will poison everything. And so the best protection against that is to keep yourself in the obedience that comes from faith and to guard your own heart um, from guile, from poison, from toxic thoughts and things. And that's why if you think about him coming and you're living in the countenance, the shining the um, light of his countenance, that will help to keep your heart pure. And it will also mean that when you, you can pray for, for those that are despitefully using you, pray for those that are persecuting you, pray for those that um, call themselves your enemies, pray for those. And at the same time, you'll also be equipped to um, stand strong in the spirit because there'll be no condemnation in your own heart. You'll be free of guilt and all that sort of thing too. So um, that's my application for today from Romans 16. So finally, just to finally finish the whole book of Romans and move on to the next one, which I'll start next time, is um, just to finish off with this prayer. Amen. So Lord, I just thank you. I thank you for those that hear this message. I thank you, Father, that if they're born again, they've got recreated hearts that are the perfect soil for your incorruptible seed. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you know exactly what seed that every particular heart needs to hear today. And I thank you that as they hear it and it witnesses with their spirit, witnesses with them, that they will um, re-sow it back into their own hearts. They will spend time meditating on whatever that truth is and give it opportunity to germinate in the soil that is their heart so that it can produce a 30, 60 and 100 fold um, harvest. Thank you so much for this incredible work of Paul's and for his life so utterly lived to preserve it with integrity as truth for us so that we can walk the same path and enjoy the same fruits of salvation in Christ Jesus. Thank you for preserving your word for us, Lord, so that we can have it today in so many different languages and forms. May all of our lives reflect the same reverent commitment to your word as final authority and as Lord in our lives and to being, being led according to your spirit. May this month's study of the book of Romans um, build in our hearts a more sturdy foundation of the righteousness that we have become in Christ Jesus and cause us to meditate on it and grow in it more and more. To the praise of your glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. I can see Michelle. And um, I don't know who the other person is. I can see Michelle. Lydia, it's Lydia. Hi, Lydia. <laughs> nice to see you. Sorry, because your tiny little pictures are up in the corner of my phone and they're very little. So anyway, I'm done for now and I'm going to move on and I'll be back next time with my daily devotion and um, working through the, the scripture, the observation, the application and the um, prayer. 
Amen. And I hope that it's been of use to you. Share, share in the comments if you did get something from it. And I'll see you again next time. Bye, everybody. See ya.